Okay, we're back to the attack. As I was saying before, many Native Americans or Indians died while trying to get into Fort Detroit. That same night, the Indians crept up the walls and started fires against the wooden fort. As you see in this picture here, there's a wooden wall built all the way on, around the fort for protection. While this was happening, the British soldiers raced back and forth, dumping buckets of water on the fires. The battle for Detroit went on for weeks and weeks because Pontiac's men could not get inside the fort and the British couldn't leave. Because they couldn't leave, the British were running out of bullets and food, and the Indian warriors needed to go gather food for the winter approaching. At the time, it was about fall, and in order to be prepared for the long, harsh winters, the Native Americans needed to have enough food during the times when they weren't able to get things from nature, like berries, and the animals may be more scarce at this time. So, which side will give it up? Will give up first? In late October, Pontiac got a message from the French saying that they had made peace with Britain, who had kicked them out of their land, and weren't coming back. And Pontiac, since he was good friends with the French, thought maybe if he could take back the fort, like Fort Detroit, that the French would come back and they would be able to trade again. But, like the French said, the French weren't coming back, so Pontiac decided to stop the attack. This fight had lasted for 153 days, which is the longest Native American battle in our country. The, Bridget, the British were still worried, though. The tribes worked together, and Pontiac urged them to continue to fight the British. And the British ended up losing five of their forts, and one of these forts lost was Fort Michel, Michel and Mackinac, over by Mackinac Island. Fort Michilimackinac take over. The Native Americans <coughs> used this fort to trade. The British were confused though, so that they contacted the British and they entered into the fort and saying that they would like to trade. But the only thing the Native Americans wanted to trade for were tomahawks, which we saw in the previous slide. One of the traders in this fort was named Alexander Henry, and he went to go talk to the, to the commander of the fort while the two tribes were going to play a kind of ball game. Mr. Henry was worried something was going to happen, but the commander didn't listen to him. Many of the soldiers came out to watch the game, but the Indian women appeared to be cold because they were all wrapped in blankets even though at this time it was pretty warm out, so it was strange that they were wearing blankets. Suddenly the ball went over the wall and the play players rushed in after it. As they ran, they grabbed their weapons under the blankets. It was a quick victory and many soldiers were killed, but Alexander Henry did survive. Here is a picture of the fort, of what it may look like today. And over here is a little clip from the journal or the diary of Alexander Henry. So remember last week we talked about a primary source and we read a few quotes and pieces from Father Marquette's journal from his time on the Mississippi River. And here we have a quote from Alexander Henry from his diary. Ichibwe came to tell me that his nation was going to play Bagat Iwe which is the ball game they were playing, with another Indian nation for a large bet. He invited me to witness the sport, and he said the commandment, which is the commander, was to be there and would bet on the side of the Chippeways. I went to the commander and talked with him a little. I wondered if the Indians might possibly have something evil in mind, and the commander only smiled at my suspicions. So, really, Alexander Henry was right and Mr. Henry knew that the Native Americans were up to something. <clears throat> here we have Fort St. Joseph, which you look, here is about in present day Michigan, this is where St. Joe is, and this is another fort that was taken over by the Native Americans uh, under Pontiac's rebellion. 
The tribes captured Fort St. Joseph in May of 1763. The fort is along the St. Joe River and is quite a small fort, as you can see in the picture, and most of the soldiers were killed and the commander was taken prisoner, and the Indians had him march all the way back to Detroit. And this fort is near the current city of Niles, Michigan, if you've ever been there. I know I have a couple different times. Leading up to this is the Proclamation of 1763. It took a while for all of the tribes to make peace, especially because of Pontiac's Re Rebellion, which is what we called the war that was happening between the Native Americans and the British. But peace didn't happen until 1766. Pontiac showed courage and tried to help his people, but the British moved back into their forts, they, although they were still worried about more trouble with the Indians. The tribes were still angry and the settlers were taking over their land. So in 1763, the British passed a law stopping settlers from going west, which we call the Proclamation of 1763. This law let the Native Americans pursue their happiness and they could hunt where they wanted and live wherever they wanted. As you see in the map over here, the line of the Proclamation of 1763 saying that no settlers could pass the Appalachian Mountains, and that's this yellow line right here that we see, the yellow dotted line. So, the settlers were only allowed to stay along the East Coast, and this is where you can see many different names of different Native American tribes. We see the Ottawa, the Ojibwe, the Potawatomi, all um, different, and the Miami, all different tribes that we've talked about, and I'm sure some of these other ones sound familiar as well. When we say that the Native Americans were able to pursue their happiness, this is actually a core democratic value, which is something that as an, in an American today, we are allowed to have this. And it means to let people do what they want, let them be happy as long as it does not bother anyone else. So when it says, let people do what they want, of course we can't go out and do anything super crazy, but it's meaning that they, we try to make everybody happy so everybody is able to have their way. After the proclamation of 1763, the Native Americans were happy that they had all this land, but the settlers were upset. So not everybody can get what they want, and, we, and not everybody will be happy with decisions that are made. The settlers wanted to move west so they could have more land and start farms. And many wanted to get away from the crowded towns that were in the east, which later led to problems with the British. So this is something that we call cause and effect. So let's even just say, thinking about so things that we do today. If I have a row of dominoes that are set up, I know that some of, I've seen a few people do this during recess time, when we have indoor recess. If I tip with my finger the first domino on the line, the effect of that is it's going to bump into the next one and all the rest of the dominoes will fall over. Or if I have a glass of water and my hand accidentally bumps it to the side of my desk, the effect would be that because of gravity, the cup's going to fall to the ground and my water will spill all over, all over the floor. So a few different things. You can even think about if you know maybe you didn't listen to one of your parents when they told you to clean your room, that's your cause. The effect is that you're probably most likely going to get in trouble and still have to clean your room. So there's a few examples of cause and effect that we can see in our lives. But cause and effect after the proclamation of 1763, we can look. The French lost the war with the British. Um, and the French had the help with also the, the Native Americans. And the effect of that was that the British took control of Michigan. So they pushed the French right out of Michigan. Another cause is that Pontiac, Chief Pontiac of the Ottawa tribe, led the tribes to attack the British, which we know as the P Pontiac Rebellion. And the effect of this is that the British made the proclamation of 1763. We could even add another one of what we looked at up here is that the cause would be that the British made the proclamation of 1763. Our effect would be 
that the settlers were upset by this because they wanted to move more west to have more land and start farms, which in turn made them really angry. Among all of this, Chief Pontiac had a friend named Jean de Sable, and he was the black fur trader that came to Michigan in 1760 with a French background. So he spoke French and had a French background, but he was born in Haiti, which is an island in the, the Atlantic Ocean, right underneath the United States. So as it says there, like we just said, um, he was friends with Chief Pontiac and he lived near Pontiac's camp and traded often with them. And when Pontiac left Michigan, so did the Sobel, and he settled into the area which is now known as Chicago. And as you can see here, there's they have a statue of him along the bridge here, right in downtown Ch Chicago. And he is actually noted as the founder of Chicago, like the first resident, the first person to live there in Chicago, which is pretty cool that that history goes back that way. So here's a quick review of everything that we've talked about so far in this unit. We have a little timeline here about the early years of the French in Michigan. So in 1618 to 1620, we have Roule as the first French person to reach Michigan. And then we go about 40 years later and Father Marquette starts Sault Ste. Marie, the first French town in Michigan. And then another about 40 years later, Cadillac starts Detroit in 1701. Then Fort Michelin Mackinac is built across from Mackinac Island in 715. Forty years later, we have the French and Indian War. That was from 1754 to 1763, or we can also call it the Seven Year War. Also during that time, because of the French and Indians lost to the British, the British took over Detroit in 1760. Three years later, Pontiac was fed up with the British and led the Pontiac's Rebellion, which lasted 153 days if you remember from the previous slides. This was several different Native American tribes who attacked all the forts that British had took control of. And during that time, we don't know the exact date, Jean de Sable also came in and resided near Pontiac's tribe and traded with them. Also in 1763, Fort St. Joseph was captured and Fort Michelin Mackinac was captured by the Indians until finally in 1763, the British Proclamation of 1763, given by King George III over in England, or I'm sorry, in Britain, <coughs> became a law saying the settlers couldn't go past the line of the Appalachian Mountains. So that is your lesson about the beginning of Detroit and who founded Detroit, the French and Indian War, and you know a little bit more about the history in Michigan with the French. Now sit tight and wait for further instructions. Nice job listening. Thank you.